the, the Mexican scenario 10 years ago was the next one. Uh, there was a very low availability of, of human resources, uh, qualificated human resources. Uh, the, the domestic market was growing at a negative rate, and our exports of IT services were less than $200 million per year, millions with an M. The current scenario is uh, exports around $6 billion US dollars with, with a B, uh, according to different analyst firms, uh, including Stephanie's uh, former employer. Uh, we're ranked number three in the world. Uh, the, the human uh, uh, capital availability is around 90,000 engineers graduating from school each and every year. And our, our domestic market is growing at a 15% average rate annually. So I think that more than competing with, with other countries like, like, uh, like India, China, Philippines, uh, for, for the U.S. Uh, market, we have been working together, diversifying the different strategies and, and everything. And, and in Mexico, we work with the government, with the academia, and we truly believe that, uh, that the better we do our job, the, the better that everybody uh, in, in this industry can and, and will be will get things done. So uh, with that in mind, I leave you with uh, Tom Taylor. Thank you very much, Tom. It's really a pleasure working here with you. The premise of what I want to uh, talk to you today about is that for those of you that have worked offshore, there are some structural challenges uh, around work that's sent offshore. And so nearshore is a great proposition, and I'll feature why Mexico is a particularly good option within the region. So first some definitions. So nearshore, I've learned it's smart to try and get aligned on definitions. Nearshore, I am, for the purpose of this discussion, including Mexico and South. So it can include the Caribbean too. It's Mexico and South. So that's nearshore. Onshore, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm including the US, the domestic sourcing industry. So I'm excluding that from the definition of nearshore. I'm also excluding, for, the, for this purpose, Canada, uh, which is nearshore, uh, but there's other considerations, and it's not really most in most people's definition of, of nearshore. So offshore is everything else, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia Pacific. That's what we all know. Then there's, then there's Jersey Shore. <laughs> it's near. It's a shore, but it's not nearshore. So even though we're all actually on Jersey Shore here right now, uh, that's not part of the definition. So let's talk first about offshore. There's a lot that's going very well with the offshore delivery model. Uh, got off to a little bit of a rocky start, but what's happened over time is that there's process maturity, the infrastructure is stable, the uh, uh, supply of labor is tremendous, and so there's a lot that's going well. It's a huge market, and it's growing at an enormous rate, maybe 16% a year, depending on which source you look at. So, so why is that important? It's because there's a lot of demand. You know, in this economy, to have some sector of our industry, say any industry, growing at 16%, that is significant for attracting alternatives. And so when you think about, it's pretty basic, there's a food supply here. And so there's a lot of other sources of, of, cap, of, of labor that can be deployed for the purposes of satisfying the demand in, in this country. Uh, and this is a drum that gets beat a lot, and you might be sick of it, but it's, it, it is meaningful because if you're trying to collaborate with your partner offshore, it's gonna come at somebody's inconvenience. You know, your morning call is gonna be their evening and vice versa. And if you have something you need to do or you know, want to talk to your partner Friday morning, it's pretty much already you know, their weekend. So, it's, uh, so the concern is that also, as was mentioned in the last panel, if you're trying to do agile development and you want to collaborate with your technical team, then that's, that's more complicated with, with an offshore model. Uh, I give offshore companies a lot of credit for their ability to make process improvements. They're very effective in, in solving things with process. But some of these things that I'm pointing out here aren't really addressable with process, just process improvements. They're, they're structural, and this has created the opportunity. It's opened the door for alternatives. Let's talk a little bit about what's, what's important, and I've also heard, heard words about these things uh, from others today. Uh, I think the, what's important to people looking for alternatives, that's changing a bit. 
or at least it's evolving. So I take costs. And uh, one of the folks here who was up here pointed out appropriately that cost used to be focused on dollars per hour. Rate, you know, hourly rates, that's now evolving to include in the consideration what it takes to manage your offshore team, the travel expense. Uh, so there's other duplications and things that, that add up to the total cost. That's improving. Um, the skills used to be that there was a great interest in just getting access to technical skills. And that's not enough anymore. So what I hear from people is that they not only want technical skills, but they want people who can interview users, can interact and get requirements. Those kinds of thought leadership, industry knowledge, you know, the bar is being raised. So this and a number of other things that I've got listed here that you can see. Where to go? I'm going to, I'm going to take this, um, uh, this model from Gartner. Gartner does, for the last several years, this top 30 locations for outsourcing. And they break it down into three regions. Uh, so Asia Pacific, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and the Americas. 30 countries. Of those 30, eight of them are in Latin America. Okay? And the way that they compare them, they have some evaluation factors which include things like cost, language, access to labor, government support, et cetera. And so they don't so much answer which one is right for you, because if you've gotten anything about the, out of this today, there is no right answer. It's really relative to your priorities, your objectives, et cetera. But at least there are some evaluation factors that are interesting to gather as you make your own judgment. So how do these countries compare? Um, the top rated countries are in the middle column. And so what I wanted to point out is that you see Latin America is very well represented in those that are among the top rated. And I want to get into a little bit as to, as to why. And then also, if you look and see, you know, Mexico is very well represented. And I also want to explain a little bit as to why that's the case. So the Latin America business climate is particularly well suited for the export of services. Why is that? There are a lot of large multinational companies that are based in or have subsidiaries in Latin America. So there is a, remember the comment that Kirk started with at the beginning of the day, that there's smart people everywhere? There's an indigenous population who's had to serve their own needs within Latin America for many, many years. So the, uh, you couple that with what is the demand, or as I call the food supply here in the, in the US market, and this creates then the right chemistry to, to create um, you know, interest in serving and growing uh, the, the U.S. market. The labor pool in Mexico for IT services, about 600,000 people. Uh, it's a good number also in Brazil, about 250,000. Argentina is growing like a weed. And so there's a, there's a large pool of IT services, uh, IT labor, that's coming through a university system that is generating you know, the, the, uh, the, technical, the technical supply the supply of technical resources. The, the way that they're growing their presence here in the US, and you see a lot of it out here, is that there are trade promotion groups, economic uh, uh, development groups that are promoting their capabilities to the US market. So you got Brascom here, Mexico IT, uh, a lot of countries, big and small, are trying to get exposure to the wealth of activity that they have and can make available to the US market. What they're also doing is investing in things like technology parks, tax incentives. Uh, in Mexico, there is a cost reimbursement for, for labor under certain circumstances. So there's this public sector involvement in trying to grow this, uh, grow this industry. So Mexico has special status uh, out of Latin America for a number of reasons. Um, it, this is an industry within Mexico serving their own market that's been around for decades. Uh, and there are a lot of large companies that are sophisticated and need that talent in order to satisfy their own needs. There's, like I said, 600,000 people, about 90,000 a year come out of university, uh, and there's about 1,400 IT companies that are providing services, not all for this, for this market, but there's 1,400 in total, and then a number of them who are represented here as well in trying to serve the US market. Where do IT services come from? There's uh, 31 states in Mexico, and there's, uh, most of the IT services are coming out, about, out of about seven of them. So um, a little bit about what distinguishes Mexico. So uh, I'm not sure it's been mentioned up till now about NAFTA. 
So NAFTA has um, a special status for citizens of Mexico and Canada for being able to come to the U.S. and work with fewer restrictions than you would if you came in on an H-1B visa. So I, I've, I've worked with offshore, I've worked with, with resources and brought them in to, to this country from, from everywhere. And if I need somebody from, from Mexico and need them for more than an eight week knowledge transfer period and don't have to worry about what kind of work they do, uh, then um, Mexico has, through NAFTA, those advantages. If someone comes in a business tourist visa, then it's a delicate operation and they can only come in so, so, many, so many times. The H-1B program, it came up earlier. That's a big topic. Uh, immigration reform is currently being pressed uh, in Washington. And the implication it seems to, to be right now is that while the cap will be raised, there will be additional restrictions. So the consequence will be that for companies that rely a lot on H-1B um, uh, personnel, uh, that they're going to become under a little bit of stress. And it's, it's maybe too early to say exactly what that is, and I don't want to speculate. The only point of, of making that uh, distinction is that there's uncertainty there. Security is a concern for some companies that investigate Mexico. So uh, my observation is, uh, and not, not for all, but for some it is a concern. And, and the, uh, my observation is that there's a gap between the headlines and the data. So all I would encourage you to do is, is to uh, take a look at the data. So if I were to compare, which I've done, Monterey to New York, they're about comparable in terms of, of things that, that uh, concern most people, which is, which is homicides. If you then look at other cities like Las Vegas, or DC, or uh, Philadelphia, New Orleans, then the risk uh, gets worse. And I have had this discussion with people in places where conferences like this are held, in Vegas and New Orleans. And when I asked them, did you have concern about coming here? And of course they don't because they know where they're going and they know what they're doing. So it's, uh, I, I was in Monterey last week. Uh, I'm not in the drug trade and I'm not responsible for enforcing any of the laws around the drug trade. So that puts me in the safe, you know, the safe majority. Uh, and because I have hosts, as you would if you were to visit Mexico or Monterey, that know where to take you, it's kind of like, because I grew up here, I know where to go, where not to. So common sense applies. So what's it like to work with, uh, with a provider out of Mexico? So one, one dimension is English, English proficiency. And if you... Uh, are familiar with working with Brazil or India or, or, or China, generally the English is okay. You can get by and that's something that they've addressed. It is better in Mexico and in Argentina. Another factor in the way that, uh, the way it's, uh, what it's like to work with uh, resources out of uh, Mexico, uh, or near shore really for that matter, is that the model is pretty much, the delivery model is similar to what you would expect. You know, there's methodology, there's process, there's governance, there's things that you would consider normal. Uh, so the difference from a Mexico standpoint, and this chart shows on-site team on the left, remote team on the right, is that the left side of the chart is easier to deliver. And like I said, I, I can get people here more easily. If they're here for a month, they need to be here for three months. You know, that's easier because of NAFTA and the immigration uh, status that we can get with TN visas. So, so that, that's a real plus, especially with the uncertainty of projects. And, uh, and if you need post-production support that's going to run instead of two months, it's going to run four, then we, it's not a mad scramble. Uh, those folks can remain. A couple reasons why it's worth considering near shore and particularly Mexico. Uh, I mentioned first the, the total cost of services. So that cost gap between uh, offshore services and nearshore, that's narrowing a bit because of the geographic and certainly the time zone proximity. Um, so in any business case, it's worth taking these things into account because there's a lot of business cases that started on offshore that just got blown out of the water because once you added up the travel and the duplicate you know, management teams and all those things, then that, you know, that huge savings turned out to be something uh, less than expected. 
The AT, IT wage uh, is also a consideration too because there's two things going on. There's, there's economic inflation, and I gave you a comparison earlier, but there's also demand-driven wage, uh, wage inflation. So as things become more in demand, then, uh, that, then that, that adversely impacts the source of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the labor. So, so that's also worth uh, considering. So what I hope you do is that you continue your research into nearshore. And if you do, you've got you've to look at Mexico uh, for the reasons I stated and for more reasons that I hope you can access through uh, work like, like Luke's. Uh, so Gardner uh, and other research analysts, they, they have a high regard for Mexico. It, uh, so there's, there's uh, unanimity around Mexico's place in terms of being a, um, a, a very um, well-established place for, for sourcing IT services. So, uh, so with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you for your interest and attention.